What I'd like to do is to, first of all, ask you to take a minute. I want you to take a minute to think of an excellent hospital. Think of a hospital where you would want to send your closest loved ones to if they need very high quality care. The first hospital that comes to my mind is an eye hospital that I have worked with for many years the Arvind Eye Hospital in southern India. It's the biggest eye hospital in the world. They actually treat two-thirds of the volume of the NHS at one-hundredth of the cost, and with outcomes comparable to the best hospitals in the world. And traditionally, they've seen about half of their patients for free. So how did this hospital in India manage to achieve these inconceivable results? It comes down to the clarity of their founder's mission statement. Eliminate needless blindness. I happened to go on a trek last fall to the Himalayas after I'd finished my teaching. And I could see beautiful high-altitude plants close up. But it was only when I looked up that I saw the mountains. I could see Mount Makalu standing over 8,000 meters high. And this is Lhotse, standing at over 7,000 meters. This little pimple in the back is Everest. This really got me thinking about goals. I've seen that it's true for individuals and also for organizations that whatever is closest looms largest. And the faraway goals are much harder to see. How can you possibly climb Mount Everest if you haven't even seen it? That's a first step. And once you've seen it, you would need to decide that you want to go for it. Arvind's founder was a retired government doctor. And he founded Arvind in his brother's house as a 12-bed hospital. But he had conceived of achieving an inconceivable goal. Cataract is the world's largest cause of blindness. And cataract surgery is a bread and butter surgery. It's done in almost every hospital, standard process, good outcomes. But considering where they came from, it would have been impossible for Arvind to achieve this inconceivable goal by just doing the standard process and doing it better. They really needed to do something different. And having this inconceivable goal gave them the liberty to take apart a very standard surgery process. This is an image, an older image, of cataract surgery at Arvind. There are only two doctors in the room. And the doctors are doing only those parts of the surgery which only the doctors have the expertise and the experience to perform. And by doing this, they've got huge volumes. It turns out that my older boy had a chance to do an internship at Arvind a few years ago. And I said to him, you're a smart boy. I want you to find out their secret sauce. I was thinking that he'd tell me it was about the training of their surgeons, or the huge amount of experience that these surgeons get, or the fact that they agreed to do this type of surgery. But here's what he said. He said, Mom, it's those young women. Those young women. 
they are basically science high school grads who are recruited from remote villages. And they're indebted to the hospital for giving them a job. They work extremely hard. They live in a women's hostel with curfew rules. Why is that important? These women come from very conservative village households. And for their families to allow their daughters to work at Arvind, they need to trust the hospital. What Arvind has done is built trust by basically creating a home away from home environment for these young women. And when they reach about 21 or 22, it's time for them to go back to their native village to get married. Arvind picks the cream of the crop and has them man village uh, telemedicine centers. So they are basically creating a network of influencers in their rural hinterland. And these women are building trust. Trust in telemedicine and trust in Arvind. And this is helping Arvind with going closer to its inconceivable goal, eliminating needless blindness. When, cat when uh, COVID hit, Arvind didn't hi uh, fire a single employee, not one. And when I asked them, they said, you can always pay to hire a resume, but you can't buy a relationship. If you think about it, trust transforms transactions into something beautiful, relationships. You might be thinking that all of this is just about this one hospital, but I've seen these methods work for many organizations and for individuals. Think about education. Every parent wants their children to have the best possible education. But depending on your circumstances, this could be an inconceivable goal. Four years ago, I visited this slum in India. And I was talking uh, to a mother and her two daughters in Hindi in their home. The mother said to me, I will give my kidneys for my daughter's education. And then a third daughter came in to the room. And so I asked her, what do you want to do in your life? And she said to me in English, human rights lawyer. I happened to go back to the same slum last month. And I talked to this family. This girl has gotten herself an undergraduate degree through a correspondence course, not the way most of us got our education. And she's working for a big firm. The mom told me, I will only consider marriage proposals for my daughters from families who will allow them to continue their education. If you think about families like these and the ones that the young women who work at Arvind come from, they're very conservative families. And for a girl child, the dream is a secure and sheltered life and marriage. Just think about the trust that they have bestowed on their daughter to let her go out and work. I've seen these Methods work all over the world. This is Camden, New Jersey. It's a very poor population, like the population that Arvind serves. There's a lot of chronic disease, diabetes, drug addiction. There are babies dying, dying because mothers are on drugs. With chronic disease, 
it is super important for the patient to come for their regular doctor checkups. This keeps patients out of the emergency room where they would arrive with an expensive disease flare-up. Health for this kind of population is a dream. Keeping them healthy is a dream. Poor people have hugely unpredictable schedules, and they don't have good transport. So they skip doctor appointments. The Cooper University Hospital, located in Camden, decided to use a method that was developed in the US to tackle this problem, shared medical appointments. In a shared appointment, a doctor gives one-on-one -on -one treatment to each patient, but they're in a group of patients who share the same disease. So it's individual attention, but it's not private. The doctor obviously saves time because they don't have to repeat common information. And so productivity increases. The patients get to hear a lot more information. And so it's better for them as well. And if at Camden, a patient had skipped their appointment and just happened to bumble into the hospital, they would immediately usher the patient into a shared appointment. So every single opportunity for contact with the patient is utilized. When I first came across shared appointments, I really wanted to take this idea to other hospitals, and I wanted to study it scientifically. I literally went to hospitals on three continents, and everybody said no. Lord Darcy, who is a surgeon at Imperial College Hospital, said to me, Kamalini, I'm a colorectal surgeon. I see no use for shared appointments. Later on, we collaborated, and we wrote two short pieces on the importance of trying out really d different ways to deliver care to achieve an inconceivable goal, healthcare for all. But I still wanted to study this scientifically. But in the meantime, I decided to ask Arvind if I could see their surgery process. They said to me, yes, you can, but you're coming from the West, so you need to tell us something new. So I told them about shared appointments. And then I came back to London. And in a few weeks, they contacted me. They wanted to try them out for glaucoma. Glaucoma is the second biggest cause of blindness worldwide. It is an incurable, irreversible, hereditary disease. The only thing you can do to stop its progression is to keep coming back for those regular doctor checkups. Take your eye drops and a surgery if needed. The reason that Arvind had got this idea is because they ask visitors for new ideas. Arvind does some, everything very differently. And to do that, they've got to build trust. And they're willing to learn from anywhere. They even learn internally. So the first thing they did with shared appointments, they got a counselor, not a doctor, to run a shared group counseling in which they counseled each patient one-on-one -on -one in the group. I happened to be there. The third patient took some eye drops out of his pocket and asked the doctor a question. 
And the moment he d did that, I saw the second patient whose turn had already gone by, and he took out his eye drops because he wanted to ask a question. There was one woman who said that she'd had glaucoma for 20 years, and another patient said, can you see? And she said, yes, I can. And I've taken my eye drops every day, twice a day, for 20 years. Arvind could see the impact that her statement had on her peers. They decided to do another weekend pilot with the doctor. At the end of this pilot, I asked Dr. Kavita, what do you think? She said, it felt like a wedding. If you've ever seen an Indian wedding. <laughs> but they did more pilots. And eventually, we ran a 1,000 patient trial where we compared shared medical appointments against usual care for glaucoma. We found that patients in shared appointments were asking way more questions. They were nodding their head way more in engagement, and they were 40% less likely to not comply with taking their medications. I talked to some of these patients after the trial ended, and a couple of them told me that they had asked relatives to go and get checked for glaucoma after being in a shared appointment. And one of them told me, I found a friend. The reason that Arvind did this massive trial goes back to their mission statement. They share all their ideas with everyone. They don't care who eliminates needless blindness. But to share ideas, and good ideas, they need evidence. We had created evidence. The WHO has gotten interested in shared appointments, and we've written with the WHO about shared appointments, which further advances Arvind's goal. I've shared with you how Arvind and other organizations and individuals have gotten closer to their inconceivable goals. You need to find your Everest, and you need to decide that you want to go for it. You'll need to do things differently. And to do that, you'll need to build trust. You need to be open to taking ideas from practically anywhere. If you do these things, you'll get closer to that inconceivable goal. Thank you.